And for a Christian, the Quran is really intimidating because Muhammad is really likes to instruct Christians what they should believe. For example, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. God somehow took him at the last moment and he ascended into heaven. And Jesus isn't divine either. He's just a normal human being. So, this really is hitting the touch points of what Christians believe. So, my time in the car was not a time to wimp out. It was not a time to say, ah, there is no difference, don't worry about it, let's talk about something else really, really quickly. But it also wasn't time to try and win an argument for the sake of winning an argument. Because the aim is not to win an argument, but to see real change. And that takes love and patience. So, let's 1 John chapter 4. Let me read the first verse. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. So what John is doing in this passage is he's really laying out how you tell if someone is speaking the truth or not the truth. He's really, he's really laying the early benchmarks of what makes a Christian and what doesn't. So, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about three big statements about what we believe, almost creed-like statements which John makes. And then he talks about two different kinds of behaviours which should be typical of Christians. John's really helpful in that he likes to repeat himself and say things in different spots. And then he always says things slightly differently each time. So, um, for a person like me, who likes to go from one point to the other, Almost be annoying, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> so, my creed state, and, and I'm going to be even more confusing, I'm going to take them out of the order. So, I'm going to look at verse 10 first, then 14, 15, and then verse 2. Verse 10. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So from my conversation in the car, the first point, Jesus did die. And Jesus just not died a natural death, He was a sacrifice. very ancient imagery and the translators had fun trying to translate it. What we're talking about is an angry God and a sacrifice is made to turn away God's anger. So when the sacrifice is made, God is no longer angry. basic things we believe is that God is a holy God. God is a just God. And we have sinned. Now what do I mean by sin? Sin really is rebellion against God. It's us saying we want to do things our own way, God. We don't want you messing around with our lives all the time. So it really is trying to be independent Punishment for rejecting our Creator is death. And what Jesus has done is Jesus has died in our place 
so that Jesus is punished and we are set free. This is almost a legal basis for us being forgiven. And it is very much the starting point of all that we believe as Christians. Now, verse 14 and 15. For, furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Son of God? In John 3.16 it talks about Jesus being the only begotten Son of God. It really does mean that Jesus is special. Jesus is more than just a human being. And the idea that the Father sent his Son really does imply that Jesus is actually divine and that he pre-existed his natural birth. The reason why this is really important and why this is just not a strange optional extra is that for the sacrifice to work, for Jesus to be our substitution, he had to not sin. He had to be, he had to be separate from, from our natural inclination to rebel. So God came down in the form of Jesus to live our life and to be that sacrifice. Now, God is a mystery. We don't know everything about God, and I don't think we could ever comprehend everything about God. If you try to work out how the Trinity worked to the nth degree, you're going to end up in strange places. But God has given us an image that we can understand. The image of a Father and a Son. And we're not talking about an adult father and a child son. We're talking about an adult son. The image almost is of a father and a son working together. It's almost the father raising the son up and at the point he starts to give the son a primary role in the company, in the business. And that's what we have with Father God and Jesus. We have Jesus taking a more dominant role and taking care of us. Back to verse 2. This is how we know that if we have the Spirit of God, if a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real way. So we have almost two statements here. So Christ is not Jesus' surname. It's a statement about who he is. So Christ is the Greek version of Messiah. The Jews were hoping for an individual who will show them how to live. That will be the new Moses who will give them the new law which will lead them to where God wants and the permanent kingdom. Jesus is the Messiah. We're not to look for anyone else. But Jesus also was completely real. This is where we have the idea that Jesus was both God and Jesus was human. And the importance of Jesus being fully human is to be our substitute. He had to be tempted like we are and suffer like we do and yet without sin. There's a useful verse in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. 
So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same tests, testing that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and will find grace to help us when we need it most. So as I said, and as Michelle seems to have cottoned on what I was just about to preach about, all I did was ask for one song and she knew what I was going to say. These are really the essential things. We can be tolerant about a lot of stuff. There's lots of things about church practice that we can disagree on and still be brothers. So in Bangladesh we heard of a church split about how to baptise someone. And it may not be what you're thinking. So it's dunking, both are dunking. One, one church laid the person on their back and they went under that way. And now the other church laid the person forward and they went down that way. This is not worthy of a church split. <laughs> but who Jesus is. And these were, John is almost setting this up to be the criteria of who's in and who's out. So if we read verse, um, verse 3. If a, claim, if a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus came in the real way, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such person as the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming into the world and is indeed is already here. So in a sense, these verses are really the criteria of who can be in the church and who should be in the church. So if someone comes and wants to talk up the front and is against these things, they should not be in the church. But there's actually a deeper thing going on here as well. Let me read some very famous verses. And I'm going to read one verse further than what we usually do. John 3.16 For God loved the world so much that he gave his, only, his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. So what we're saying about Jesus is the criteria for eternal life. If you don't believe these things, you will be judged. So they are the three things that we Christians believe. There are two different kinds of behaviours that should be part of the Christian life as well. Verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. We love because Jesus loved us. Yeah. 
this is we've actually learnt what God is like through Jesus' example. And that's the basis for how we should behave. All our thinking and all our ethics should be around the example that Jesus set. So what is love? Love is being kind. Love is being generous. Love is being patient. Love is being merciful. Love is considering other people more than yourself. Love is not just to your friends. Jesus said in Matthew, what use of it use is it if you are generous to someone who will give back to you? So our love should extend beyond just our friends, our natural peer group, our race, those who play hockey. In, um, in, in our home group, we're going through Mark, and we've just done Mark chapter 5. And in Mark chapter 5, Jesus heals someone who is so mentally deranged that he's completely isolated from society because he has a legion of demons. He heals a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, which means she's ritually unclean. And then he does completely the opposite. He heals the daughter of the person in charge of the synagogue. So Jesus shows mercy to a whole range of people. He doesn't pick and choose his favourites. And that should characterise our love. We should love like Jesus has loved us. The second behaviour is that we have our confidence in God. Verse 16. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love will live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus in this world. So there's lots of things that go, can go wrong in this world. There's lots of turmoil, there's lots of risk. But we have put our trust in God. And that means our confidence can be in God. We can know that no matter what is happening around us, God is taking care of us. He knows what we can handle and we can trust Him. Strange things happen when we become a Christian. And sometimes we don't notice it, but if we think about it, we should. God comes into our lives comes into our life through his Holy Spirit and he starts to change us from the inside out. We start to become better people. We learn how to love and how to be generous. One of the strange things that happens to Christians is we become more critical of ourselves the more we become like God. So it's easy to judge yourself because you'll stand to get him high. But we should be very thankful that God is changing us. If I was left on my own and tried to do good, or tried to follow Jesus, or tried to love, I would fall flat on my face. Would you believe I have a self self destructive tendency? These bad thoughts come in my head and they go whirling around. And I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and think, oh, everything is terrible. God is healing us. 
even when we lack the occasion, we can know that God is in our lives and is making us better. And one day we will stand at the judgment seat and we can have confidence that we are going to have all of our sins forgiven and live forever for eternity. Because that's what God has promised us and we have confidence in Him. Let's pray. I want to thank you, Jesus, that you gave your all for us, that you died for us, but also through your Holy Spirit you are still taking care of us. We ask that you would continue to change our hearts so that we would follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name.